All right, thank you very much. Yeah, so like uh, like was said, I'm Lukas Orsvärn and uh, I've been working on this tool called Vismut for a while. And uh, it's a node-based procedural texturing tool. Um, and I'm going to talk about how I recently rewrote the backend for, I don't know, like the fourth or the fifth time <laughs> to fix some issues. So I'm going to talk about uh, what the issues were and uh, how, how I fixed them and what I learned. Um, and this is an adaptation of a blog post that I wrote. All right, so before we get into it, let's uh, talk about some words. So you know, uh, so we're on the same page there at least. So this is a graph that you're seeing, and uh, a graph is just a collection of nodes and edges, with an edge being a connection between two nodes. And uh, in Vismut, uh, I'm dealing with the DAGs, uh, which are directed acyclic graphs, which means that they're graphs that go in one direction, so they don't have any relationships going backwards. And uh, they're acyclic, meaning you can't have cycles in them uh, or loops. And they're graphs, so they're DAGs. So in the old architecture, I had a shared memory uh, setup. So we have the GUI thread loop uh, going, doing its own thing at 60 frames per second or, or whatever. And then we have the engine loop uh, doing its own thing. So the way it worked was you, um, when you created, like uh, when you instantiated or whatever, the engine data uh, struct, it would also spawn a, a, an engine thread loop on its own thread that would uh, always check the engine data, uh, every loop. And uh, if it saw some change, if something had happened, it would uh, start processing the nodes or whatever do what, what needed to be done to, to, make, uh, to make the output uh, up to date. And um, the idea with this architecture was to make it so that the GUI would never have to wait for the engine to do something, so the GUI would be smooth, which is uh, really important for me. Uh, I value like the user experience a lot, and I feel like having a, a user interface that's always responsive is a very that's like a very basic thing there that I really want to have like built from the beginning. This architecture caused some issues, though. So first off, maybe the user doesn't want to run the engine uh, update in its own thread. Maybe it wants to run it on the main thread or in some thread pool or something. I don't know. But uh, in this architecture, it's like, no, it has to be done like this. You can't choose it. So that's not so good. Uh, also, the types and the code that you had to write uh, when using the library was kind of annoying. Um, so for instance, just to get some data from a node, you had to write something like, you had to first like, lock the engine itself, and then you had to get the node and then lock that node, and then you had to get the data from the node and then lock that data. And then you could like, read and see what, oh, what's this float on this node. And in the new architecture, that's just uh, instead, you know, you get the engine, you want to get the node, and then you then you have it, essentially. <laughs> so it's much, much easier, much easier to read, much easier to write. It also caused a bunch of timing bugs. Uh, so since uh, there are uh, two threads do working on this at the same time, it, things like the following could happen. Let's say that the, uh, the uh, GUI thread uh, adds uh, two nodes and uh, two edges between the nodes. So. Um, so the engine thread would see this and it would be like, oh great, there's something for me to do. And it would start processing the things. And as part of that, it would go through its things to do, right? And uh, it would see, oh, there are two edges going into this node. That's good to know. So it would take those two edges. And now, at this point, the GUI thread comes in and because and, uh, the user just added a new edge. So it adds a new edge. So now there are three edges uh, connecting these two nodes. But the engine, nevertheless, keeps doing its thing. It um, you know, creates a package for processing, sends that to a thread for processing. And then later on, it uh, gets uh, the result back from the thread, which is uh, you know, the buffers that are generated. And it would say, oh, I see these threads belong to this node. It would mark the node as done. 
and uh, everything is great, except it's not great because the user added a third edge. And since and now we're in a state where the node is marked as done, but the graph itself does not reflect the new edge that was added. And so these sort of like timing bugs, uh, there were uh, a lot of them. And uh, what I did to try and fix them was instead of uh, when the engine pr was processing, instead of just getting a, a tiny lock for a short amount of time, just getting as you know, just getting the edges, for instance, I would have to take a lock at the beginning of the processing and then hold that lock until uh, the uh, until the processing was done, uh, essentially. So I would extend the amount of time that the lock was held. And despite this, despite trying uh, this uh, to to make this happen, to fix these bugs. I couldn't ever actually fix all of them. Like um, I still had that one, like one bug that happened like one or a half a percent of the time where the node, like the output of the graph didn't match with the graph itself. So that was really annoying. And uh, as a result of making these uh, lock times longer, uh, also on the GUI side, um, that means that the GUI couldn't get its locks as easily. So you can, you can wait for a lock on the GUI side but I don't want to do that. Like the entire point of this architecture was so that I wouldn't have to wait for locks, that I would always be able to get it almost every frame at least. Um, so instead I try to get a lock and if I can't get one, oh well, I will try again next frame. But that doesn't work very well when, when you extend the locks to hold them for an extended period of time because then the GUI couldn't uh, get locks several frames in a row, perhaps, and uh, then that meant that maybe uh, an output was finished, but the GUI couldn't get a lock, so it couldn't display it in the user interface. And uh, beyond that, I, I'm using uh, a uh, GUI um, library called eGUI, which is an immediate mode uh, GUI library, uh, which means that it doesn't hold any state itself, it just essentially to simplify it a lot, it recreates the entire uh, user interface every frame, which means that if it can't get a lock, so it can't get any data, it can't create the user interface, meaning it would flicker in and out of existence, uh, depending on, you know, could it get the lock or not. So, with all these issues, I decided I need a new architecture. Uh, so the new architecture is, uh, first off, much simplified, uh, in terms of it's just a struct. It doesn't create its own thread loop or anything like that. And uh, if you want to run, uh, if you want to process the nodes, you have to just call a function which processes the nodes. And so you get to decide uh, uh, when and where that happens. Uh, here, this slide shows uh, the engine threads and the GUI threads over time. So. This is how it's working now in Vismut uh, with the new new architecture. So this shows one frame in the uh, GUI kind of, and the first part there is uh, it updates the GUI in the GUI thread, and uh, at that point it owns the engine, uh, so it has full access to the engine. It can uh, mutate it and read from it, etc. And when it's done with that, it sends it to the engine thread, and there the engine just gets run uh, over and over, and while that's happening, the GUI is being rendered and uh, it's waiting for vSync and so on. Um, and when the GUI uh, comes to a point where, okay, I'm done, I'm ready to, you know, I want access to the engine again, it just sends a message to the engine thread and it sends it back and it can repeat the process. And so it gets sent back and forth uh, once per frame. So this uh, vastly simplifies the code. Uh, it uh, makes it more complicated in that I have to send it back and forth, but that's not so complicated. It's pretty simple code, uh, but it makes it much easier everywhere else because you have direct lock-free access uh, to everything uh, er uh, when you need it. So, and more, more flexible as well, of course. But I didn't only make it better uh, to use it in this way. Like I didn't just make it better to use it from, from the outside. I also made it better on the inside as well. Uh, this slide shows uh, how the uh, uh, the uh, 
internal data of the engine is split up into three different worlds, as I call them. So we have the public world, uh, which is the public interface. So anything that's not in the public world isn't accessible from the outside. And uh, this contains, uh, it can have several DAGs in it, all containing several nodes and edges, and it can also have connections between the DAGs, like between nodes in the DAGs. Uh, and it can have nodes with DAGs inside them as well, which is an important aspect of like being able to create an entire DAG and then be like, okay, this DAG is now one node that you can use in another DAG, etc. And that's how you can build up uh, like a library of being able to make stuff quickly and uh, build tools with the system kind of. Um, so you have that, and that's uh, what uh, the, the library user uh, manipulates. And uh, when it wants to uh, process it, it uh, first calls uh, a prepare function on it. So it calls engine.prepare, and that uh, creates a flat world from the public world. And uh, they are similar, but the difference between them is that the flat world contains only one DAG. So if there are two DAGs in uh, the public world, uh, or three DAGs, or however many, all the nodes in those will just get lifted out and put into one single big DAG. And all the nodes that contain DAGs in them will also be like expanded out into their contents. So um, yeah, it just flattens out everything and puts, uh, makes it that there's only one big DAG now. And once it's done that, and oh, I should say, by the way, the reason for this is that it simplifies uh, the, like when you want to process these things, like when you're processing a DAG and it has like a DAGs inside of it, it gets pretty complicated. You need to write pretty uh, like complicated uh, special code to determine what happens when it starts processing a node that has a DAG inside of it. You need to do like special stuff there. Like, oh yeah, I need to like go in and like expand, like like activate the DAG and then start processing it, etc. And when all is said and done, you can't even have, you don't even have any like granular um, uh, change detection. So you can't, uh, it's really hard to uh, see like, oh, did just this node in the DAG change when the user changed the setting on it, etc. So this just like, uh, instead of trying to solve that problem, uh, I have this flat world step. Uh, that uh, makes th just makes that problem disappear. So it's not a problem that exists anymore. So I don't have to solve that problem, which is great. This is a much simpler thing, just to flatten it, rather than trying to do special cases for all the uh, nested DAGs and the sibling DAGs and so on. And so once the flat world is created, uh, from that I create a live world. And the live world has a different set of nodes from the public world. Uh, that's that are and this set of nodes is optimized for being uh, processed or f yeah for being easy to program to be processed and uh, one node in the public world or the flat world uh, one of the public nodes can turn into several nodes in the live world uh, which allows for better reuse of nodes and so on so that's how the how it's changed on the inside as well and uh, that's pretty much it uh, uh, for like how, how this has changed in the new architecture. And as for what I've learned here when I've been doing this, so first is think twice before using shared memory. Like it has the great use cases, of course, but uh, you should be aware of uh, uh, what they are, maybe. <laughs> At least and now I feel I know of one case where it's not good to use shared memory. And secondly, uh, this is something I haven't done before, which is solving a complex problem uh, by you know, simplifying it away, removing the problem by making it not a problem anymore, essentially using uh, data, like changing how the data looks to, make, uh, to, to solve problems, essentially. So that's also something that was new for me. And that is the end of this presentation. So yeah, if you're interested in uh, more information, you can go to gitlab.com slash vismuth-org slash vismuth. You can also go to vismuth.org. I don't know why I didn't put that in the slide, but yeah, that works too. <laughs> so thanks for me. Yeah, thank you. Thank you for that. Um, we got one question in the chat, which is, um, what are some UX decisions you've made with vismuth? that make it easier <clears throat> easier for the end user to use? 
Yeah, so one uh, example I gave uh, was to try to ensure that the, um, the user interface is always uh, lock-free, so that, so that it's always uh, manipulatable. And uh, other than that, like I haven't gotten that far into it yet, uh, into use, doing, creating the problem. That's also something that I should have mentioned, but I forgot to mention, is that this is still very early on. So I've rewritten it many times, and all you can do with it right now is doing like channel shuffling, where you like, decide which channel is RGB and A in images, essentially. Um, so I haven't gotten that far into the user interface yet. But the thoughts for how to make it better in the future or how to make it good is uh, one example is I don't want to have the user have to deal with a bunch of, I want to put the graph like front and center essentially. So instead of having like, oh, the graph is like in a portion of the screen there and then you have like a, a bar on the side there with a bunch of things and then you have like a preview on the bottom, etc. I want that, all of that should be the graph and then you, you can have like a better overview of it. And also I'm questioning like basic things like, do you really need to be able to just like scroll to any zoom level? Is that useful or would it be more useful to have like a minimap sort of approach where you push a button and you see all of the graph and then you choose where you want to go instead of being able to zoom out and in. Um, and uh, another thing is it, a lot of these node-based tools allow you to place nodes wherever you want. So. Uh, you know, you can place them a little, like two pixels down or whatever. Uh, well, first off, that's uh, not okay for me. They need to be on a grid. <laughs> and secondly, when I, because that's not okay for me and I have to fix it so that it's on the grid, that takes up time for me that I don't want to have to deal with, you know, spending. Uh, so I have made it so that, or I'm working on right now actually, that the nodes are always on a grid. And you don't have to worry about that, which also opens up the door for other automating, automation things, you know, making them simpler where I can actually move nodes more easily because I, I know exactly where they are. I don't have to worry about, oh, it's, but it's one pixel into above it. So should I move that if I want to move all the nodes, you know, et cetera. So yeah, there are a bunch of things like that. Like I'm not very happy with <laughs> pretty much any node based tools uh, and I've used a lot of them and I feel like uh, they, they can be better. So yeah, it's a lot of stuff like that. Cool. Um, I just wanted to, to mention that I find the the advice about shared memory very interesting, and because I I've also got burned by that before, where you have you you think you're uh, you think that like oh we'll just have locks and locks will solve all these problems, and then you go and find that like if you have to anytime you use the thing you have to take the lock and suddenly the whole world's locked out, and this very message passing e way ends up so much cleaner so that's it's very cool to see yeah exactly like there are like i'm sure i mean there are good use cases for it obviously but um you really have to like it becomes a totally different world of errors that can occur when you're when you're using shared memory essentially and you need to like uh, I ended up also doing things where, okay, so now I'm at this point and <laughs> I grabbed uh, this information. Now I need to check again, like, did something happen to this? And I need to redo previous work because something has changed now, you know, things like that. Uh, yeah, it can get really hairy and hard to understand what's going on. Cool. Um... Well, thank you so much, um, and I think we will move on to the next talk, unless there's any other last-second questions. All right, thank you very much.